Okay, thanks, Scott. And we have another tapless theology tonight. Uh, in September, we are moving to the brew pub, so we will have. But we do have. Uh, we got a lot of treats up here, and we have uh, a few other things. So you get tap water too. Help yourself. So you tap tap water, right? Tap water. So it is not you tap water. That's right. That's right. Uh, and I just noticed when I, uh, the other day when I looked at this thing they threw in the bulletin that this picture of me was actually taken in a brew pub. So <laughs> I had a, a playing gig with my son in Boise. He played the brew pub. And they took our picture. I don't know how that got in there, but, but there it is. So that's close enough to a brew pub. Um, and excuse me if I sniffle and cough a bit because I've had a little cold. So I thought since it's uh, the Feast of St. Patrick, we should start with uh, a, an excerpt which I kind of tailored from the Prayer of St. Patrick. I don't know if anybody's ever read that entire thing. It's like four pages long. So anyway, let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We come tonight through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. Lord, uphold us with your might, guide us with your wisdom. Look before us with your eye, hear us with your ear, speak for us with your word, guard us with your hand, make your way to lie before us, protect us with your shield, save us with your heavenly host. And I'd like to pray tonight especially for the people of Ukraine, uh, for a mighty miracle to be done and for that to be over with for their safety. And we ask these things all through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So the name of this talk is Medicine of Immortality, the Eucharistic Faith of the Early Church Fathers. I'm already pulling out my hands. And I'm a very, very low-tech guy. In fact, I'm a no-tech guy. So there are, there's no nothing going on up here, no pictures, uh, no handouts. I didn't even get handouts. I have a flip phone, so that's how high-tech I am. I'm not. So if, you, if you're dying to get a copy of this, I'm not sure why you would, but if you are, I can email it to you. So just give me your email, and it will be online one day. And this is a topic about which I'm rather uh, passionate, and I think this turned into a bit of an apologetic, preachy talk, so stay with me on that. And it certainly is a good day for an Irishman to be talking. According, according to a 2019 poll conducted by the Pew Research Center, just one-third of U.S. Catholics agree with the Church that the Eucharist is the body and blood of Christ. Nearly 69% say they personally believe that during Mass, the bread and wine used in communion are symbols of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Just 31% believe the Church's teach teaching regarding the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. Also, roughly 62% of those who believe the Eucharist is nothing more than a symbol think that this is the actual teaching of the Church. Only 28% know what the church teaches, that the bread and wine at the words of consecration during Mass become in substance the body and blood of the Lord and actually believe it. At their conference last summer, the American bishops initiated a three-year Eucharistic revival. This initiative is called a Eucharistic Revival, My Flesh for the Life of the World. And you can access that on our website if you, it's up, it's up. You can get a little, little video from a bishop there. The mission of this initiative is to renew the church by rekindling a living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist. In their vision statement, the bishops call it a movement of Catholics across the United States, healed, converted, formed, and unified by an encounter with Jesus in the Eucharist, and set out in mission for the life of the world. This Eucharistic renewal begins this year on the Feast of Corpus Christi, which is June 19th and it extends through 2024. Bishop Peter and the Diocese of Boise have joined in this effort. So we obviously have a real crisis of faith uh, regarding the Eucharist, which the bishops seek to address. So with this in mind, I'd like to go back to the very beginning of the church and find out what the first Catholics had to say about the Eucharist. And I'm using the writings of the earliest church fathers, that is those writing in the first few centuries of the church, to be sure, there are other writings from that time period which we still have, but they don't have anything to do with this topic, so I don't have to use those. Uh, sometimes these early fathers are called the Apostolic Fathers, as Deacon Scott said, because they had an association with an apostle 
or were alive during the lives of some of the apostles, or were one generation removed from the apostles. We need a wrench. <laughs> Their testimony carries much weight because of this. All of the ones I discuss at length died for the faith, with the possible exception of St. Irenaeus. What they say is of great importance regarding what we believe on many topics, and the Eucharist included. No one's ever going to confuse me with a theologian or a patristic scholar. I, actually, I have a master's degree in music. But I do like to read church history, especially the patristic writings, and I think it's important to know where we have come from as Catholics. We should know our roots. I find it fascinating and very enlightening. So in this talk, I'd like to relate what the Apostolic Fathers, in their own words, had to say about this great sacrament. It might help some of our less informed brothers and sisters to understand what the Church teaches. And I do include my own explanations and comments, but keep in mind that they're the comments of a trained musician, uh, not a scholar. <laughs> There doesn't help right there. Yeah. In the final analysis, you can judge for yourselves whether what the Apostolic Fathers tell us is in line with what we are taught by the Church in 2022. And one more point about the Fathers needs to be made before we get into our subject. Their testimony does not carry the weight of the Bible. No single Father has the authority of the written tradition of Scripture. No, they are merely witnesses to the living, breathing life of the church in that particular time and place in which they lived. As with many things, St. John Henry Cardinal Newman, who was himself a patristic scholar, and he really was a patristic scholar, he, was, he had incredible intellect, says it best. He writes, the fathers are primarily to be considered witnesses, not authorities. They are witnesses of an existing state of things and their treatises are, as it were, histories, teaching us in the first instance matters of fact, not opinion. Whatever they themselves might be, whether deeply or poorly taught in Christian faith and love, they speak not their own thoughts, but the received views of their respective ages. And that excerpt comes from Primitive Christianity Essays and Sketches. The fathers are therefore the literal living out through the ages of the injunction that Paul gave to his protege, Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. He says, What you heard from me through many witnesses and trust to faithful people who will have the ability to teach others as well. So we see here these generations of teaching. This is the oral tradition of the church, sacred tradition, we call that, the passing on from one generation to the next. The fathers are merely its keepers. What the fathers tell us about the Eucharist is what they have been taught and what they have lived. So here's a brief rehash of what the church actually teaches. I've got a lot of articles from the catechism. So what does the church teach about the Eucharist? According to the catechism in article 1324, the Eucharist is the source and summit of the Christian life. The Eucharist is according to article 1359, the sacrament of our salvation accomplished by Christ on the cross. Article 1374 says, in the most blessed sacrament of the Eucharist, the body and blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore the whole Christ is truly, really, and substantially contained. This presence is called real by which it is intended to exclude, it is not intended to exclude the other types of presence, but because it, it is presence in the fullest sense that is to say, it is a substantial presence by which Christ, God and man, makes himself holy and entirely present. According to Miriam Webster, I looked up some words, <laughs> substantial, means, substantial means real, true, important, and essential, ample to satisfy and nourish. And if we think of other types of ways that, that uh, Christ is present to us, you know, he's present in scripture with us. Uh, by ourselves when we're, when we're reading scripture, more so I think in the community when we're gathered uh, on, on, for the liturgy, for mass. He's with us as we proclaim publicly uh, the scriptures. He's with us in prayer, in our own private prayer, but then again when we have more than one, you know, as he says where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. He's present then also, and he's present at least I feel he's present with me when I'm giving people food over at St. Vincent. <laughs> 
helping somebody else in need, he's with us. And I feel he's with them too. So those are other ways I thought of in his presence besides the Eucharist. Article 1362 says the Eucharist is the memorial of Christ's Passover, the making present and the sacramental offering of his unique sacrifice in the liturgy of the church. Article 1364 says when the church celebrates the Eucharist, she commemorates Christ's Passover and it is made present. Article 1365 says, because it is the memorial of Christ's Passover, the Eucharist is also a sacrifice. And finally, Articles 1366 and 1367 say, the Eucharist is a sacrifice because it represents, that is, it makes present, the sacrifice of the cross. The sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice of the Eucharist are one single sacrifice. <clears throat> So those teachings of real presence and sacrifice are in the catechism, but was the Eucharist always regarded as such? That is, Jesus really and substantially present and also offering himself to us ever present in true sacrifice. You know, it would be unrealistic to think that any of the early fathers possessed a fully developed theology of the Eucharist as we think of it today. But if they mention as good witnesses attesting to fact, as Tony Newman says, the ideas of real presence and sacrifice, then we find the seeds of the fully developed Eucharistic theology that we do possess today. And I need this, excuse me. In summarizing the writings of the Fathers in his book, Early Christian Doctrines, Anglican church historian J.N.D. Kelly writes, <clears throat> Eucharistic teaching was, in general, unquestioningly realist, i.e., the consecrated bread and wine were taken to be and were treated as, and designated as, the Savior's body and blood. So with this in mind, let's listen to the words of our ancestors in the faith. And our first, we need a wrench. Our first stop is with Ignatius of Antioch, whose feast day is October 17th. He was born around 35, so right after the resurrection, or right in that time frame. And he died, uh, usual dates are between 107 and 110. He was the third bishop of Antioch. He succeeded St. Evodius, who was the direct successor of St. Peter. He was a student, a disciple of John the, the Apostle, and he was perhaps ordained by Peter. In approximately 107, during the reign of the Emperor Trajan, he was dragged in chains across Asia Minor, that's present-day Turkey, from his church in Antioch, to, in Antioch in Syria to his death in Rome. He says he is to be ground by the teeth of wild beasts to become the pure bread of Christ. On this journey, he wrote six letters to various churches and one to his friend, Bishop Polycarp of Smyrna. And Polycarp, by the way, does not mean many bottom feeding fish. <laughs> it means fruitful. These letters of Ignatius are considered invaluable in the history of Christian teaching. In them, Ignatius writes against docetism, and that word docetism comes from the Latin word docere, which means to seem. Docetism is a type of Gnosticism. Gnosticism, and that word comes from the Greek word gnosis, meaning knowledge. Gnosticism is a loose body of religious ideas emphasizing personal spiritual knowledge above accepted teachings. In Gnostic Christian tradition, Christ is seen as a divine being who has taken on human form. The Docetists, the ones Ignatius is, right, is uh, combating, that group of Gnostics, the Docetists believe that Jesus did not have a body, that he was a supernatural being who only appeared to have a body. As their name suggests, he seemed to have a body, perhaps of some sort of celestial substance. His sufferings and resurrection, therefore, were only apparent but not real. And you can pick up glimpses of this for the early Christians is problem in the letters of St. John. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 2, it says, This is how you can know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges Jesus Christ come in the flesh belongs to God. And in 2 John verse 7, it says, Many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. In both of those verses, it's obvious John is emphasizing come in the flesh. Jesus had a body. Ignatius refers to the Docetists as heterodox, that is, having incorrect belief, as opposed to the Orthodox, those having correct belief. And I'm sure John would agree with that. 
in several of Ignatius' letters, evidence for the real presence abounds. So the first excerpt is from his letter to the church in Ephesus. He says, Join in the common meeting in one faith and in Jesus Christ, who was from the family of David according to the flesh. There's the flesh again. The son of man and son of God, so that you give ear to the bishop and to the presbytery with an undivided mind, breaking one bread, which is the medicine of immortality, the antidote against death, enabling us to live forever in Jesus Christ. You can see where I, got, I stole my talk title. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is Ignatius' reference to the Eucharist as the medicine of immortality an allusion to the sixth chapter of John's Gospel? It could be. John 6.51 says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. Verse 54 says, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. After all, Ignatius was a student of John's, and he was possibly familiar with this gospel, or he even heard John relate these words of Jesus at some point in time. You can draw your own conclusion. And now an excerpt from his letter to the church in Rome. He says, I have no taste for corruptible food or for the pleasures of this life. I desire the bread of God, which is the flesh of Jesus Christ, who was of the seed of David. And for drink, I desire his blood, which is love incorruptible. Well, this statement seems pretty self-evident to me. The bread of God is the flesh of Jesus Christ, plain and simple. But is he also referring in this a little section to his struggles with the docetists. In both of these, he, he emphasizes seed of David come in the flesh, the same thing that John emphasized. And remember that he was probably ordained by Peter, and he was a, a disciple of John's. Then, from his letter to the church in Philadelphia, he says, Take care, then, to use one Eucharist, so that whatever you do, you do according to God. For there is one flesh of Jesus Christ and one cup in the union of his blood, one altar, as there is one bishop with the presbytery and my fellow servants, the deacons. Well, there is a great stress on unity in this statement. One Eucharist, one flesh, one cup, one altar, one bishop. As Eucharistic people, we are called to be one in Christ. But an interesting word in this statement for me is the word altar. He must be referring to the table at which the Christians meet for the Eucharistic ritual. But what happens at an altar? An altar is a place of sacrifice. That's why men get married in front of them. No. <laughs> Sorry, Kathy. That was <laughs> my wife sitting up here. <laughs> Actually, it was that for her. <laughs> so it seems there is perhaps some type of sacrifice taking place. This belief in sacrifice is going to recur again in more depth in our other fathers. And finally, <clears throat> from his letter to the church in Smyrna, where his friend Polycarp was the bishop, he says, Take note of those who hold heterodox opinions on the grace of Jesus Christ, which has come to us, and see how contrary their opinions are to the mind of God. They abstain from the Eucharist and from prayer, because they do not confess that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Flesh which suffered for our sins and which the Father in his goodness raised up again. They who deny the gift of God are perishing in their disputes. So again, what does he mean by heterodox opinions? You know, those are beliefs at variance with official orthodox teachings, incorrect belief. Ignatius explains what he means by these incorrect beliefs, these incorrect opinions regarding the Eucharist. He says that those who do not confess that the Eucharist is the flesh of Jesus Christ are those who hold heterodox opinions. But why do they have this belief? <clears throat> it's not because they were taught that it is only a symbol, as about 70% of Catholics apparently believe, but rather because they are docetists. Docetists don't believe Jesus had a body of flesh at all. So why would they care about receiving the Eucharist? Did they abstain from it? There's no point in receiving it because it is meaningless to them. But implicit in the statement of Ignatius is the fact that the real presence is the accepted lived belief of the church circa 100 AD. Ignatius is using this belief in the real presence as evidence that the Docetists don't believe Jesus had a real human body. And he uses this belief as his example because as he says, 
The Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ. So for Ignatius, Jesus must have had a body of flesh because the Eucharist is his flesh. What does he mean by abstain from prayer in that section? My thought is the Docetists do not attend the Eucharistic liturgy. Why would they bother? Notice also that he says that they are perishing in their disputes. And the idea of perishing is just the opposite of what he says about the Eucharist in his letter to the Ephesians when he refers to it as the medicine of immortality, enabling us to live forever in Jesus Christ. So this lack of faith in Jesus' flesh and blood presence in the Eucharist for Ignatius shows that the Docetists don't have the faith to discern his body of flesh and blood as a man. And Ignatius says they're wrong. In 1909, James Talmadge, a Mormon apostle and apologist, wrote a tract attempting to refute Catholicism entitled The Great Apostasy. His argument is that the church went off the rails almost immediately with the death of the Apostle John. And I'm using this example here not to dump on Mormons. The copy of The Great Apostasy, which I possess, was given to me by a Mormon friend of mine, very dear, wonderful friend, who's been passed away for quite a while now. Uh, so I'm not trying to dump on Mormons. I'm using this example here uh, because it is a common belief of, of some of our more fundamentalist Christian brothers and sisters as well. Sometimes you hear variants of this same theory, like the church went off the rails immediately with the last apostle dying. But variants can go all the way as far as uh, this kind of a variant. Uh, it will be equated, they will equate sacred tradition with the telephone game we play as kids. You know, you sit in a circle and whisper a sentence to the person next to you, and they whisper it, and it goes around the circle, and around the circle. By the time it gets back, it's got nothing to do with what you said first. And that sometimes is, is analogous to the original message of Jesus being completely distorted with the passage of time. And so it's not uncommon, since it's not uncommon to hear this kind of proposal, I think it's appropriate to consider insofar as sacred tradition is concerned. Anyway, Talmadge uses Ignatius as a prime witness to this apostasy because of Ignatius' obvious, very early belief in the real presence, something he wants no part of. He says, there can be no doubt as to the antiquity of the idea of the real presence of the body and blood of Jesus in the Eucharist, but that proves not that the doctrine is true, but that soon after the apostles had passed away, the simplicity of the gospel was corrupted or else entirely departed from. Now I ask myself, what would cause Ignatius to depart from the simplicity of the gospel, whatever that is in Talmadge's view? Who corrupted the gospel which Ignatius, Ignatius possesses? After all, he was combating a false and very prevalent, almost a counter church in the Docetists. And he was a student, he was a disciple of John the Apostle. Would he be so outspoken in his rhetoric regarding these heterodox docetists if he himself was heterodox? And let's not forget that he was eaten by wild animals because he refused to depart from his beliefs. Talmadge's premise strains logic way beyond the breaking point for me. Wouldn't it be much more logical to accept Ignatius' words as being the simple gospel and to think that this simple gospel of Ignatius was passed down to him by the apostles? I think it's far more likely that one faithful witness, the Apostle John, taught the simple gospel to another faithful witness, Ignatius, as St. Paul exhorts Timothy to do in his second letter. And now we've gotten past Ignatius. Nobody's sleeping out there. <laughs> we move to our next father, Justin Martyr, and his feast is June 1st. Justin was born uh, to a pagan family at Flavia Neapolis, which is present-day Nablus, about 30 miles from Jerusalem, around 100 AD. He was very interested in philosophy and was passionate in his pursuit of truth. He bounced from one Greek philosophical school to another. And, uh, ooh, when I lost my spot. Until he finally converted to Christianity through the witness of an aged Syrian Christian. This happened in the early 130s, possibly at Ephesus. He eventually went to Rome where he founded a catechetical school and became the first great Catholic apologist, training students in the art of Christian philosophy. Three of his works survive. A first apology written to the Emperor Antoninus Pius himself around 150, 
a second apology addressed to the Roman Senate, and the dialogue with Trepho, who was a Jewish philosopher, or although he could have been a made-up character uh, for the sake of argument. In about 165, during the reign of Marcus Aurelius, Justin was beheaded with six of his companions after basically being turned in as a Christian by the anti-Christian philosopher Crescens. And I'm surprised he lasted as long as he did, given how old he was. Here again. Most scholars think the first and second apologies come from one original document. <clears throat> Regardless, there's much to be gleaned about Justin's Eucharistic belief. As an apologist, he sees himself as one who is explaining Catholic teaching and ritual. This is bold stuff, actually telling the emperor what the Christians did in their meetings. After all, they are considered pagans because they don't worship the Roman gods. They've been accused of cannibalism because they meet in secret to eat the flesh and drink the blood of Jesus. And that accusation is confirmed by a later Christian writer, Municius Felix, later in the same century. So it seems to me that Justin is basically signing his own death warrant. <laughs> Would I be this bold? Uh, I'm not too sure. In this first apology, rather than denying the reality of Christ in the Eucharist, he boldly affirms it while describing the Christian gatherings. He says of the ritual, Having concluded the prayers, we greet one another with a kiss. Then there is brought to the president of the brethren bread and a cup of water and a water of wine. And taking them, he gives praise and glory to the Father of all, through the name of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And he himself gives thanks in some length, in order that these things may be deemed worthy. When the prayers and the thanksgiving are completed, all the people present call out their assent, saying, Amen. Those whom we call deacons give to each one present to partake of the Eucharistic bread and wine and water. And to those who are absent, they carry away a portion. We call this food Eucharist, and no one is permitted to partake of it, except one who believes our teaching to be true, and who has been washed in the washing, which is for the remission of sins and for regeneration, and, and is thereby living as Christ has enjoined. For not as common bread nor common drink do we receive these. But Jesus Christ our Savior was made incarnate by the word of God, and had both flesh and blood for our salvation. So too, as we have been taught, the food which has been made into the Eucharist by the Eucharistic prayer set down by him, that is by Jesus, and by the change of which our flesh and blood is nourished, is both the flesh and blood of that incarnated Jesus. There's a lot to comment on here that can't be overlooked. First, there are deacons assisting in the rite, just as there are today, today Deacon Scott. <laughs> Second, the Eucharist is taken to those not present. We do this in our own parish through the paraclete ministry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the prison ministry, and we're going to get to go back in here pretty soon. Thank you. <laughs> Third, Justin mentions what some nowadays would call a closed communion. That is, only the baptized, those who have been washed, he says, are permitted to participate. Only those who have been baptized into the life of Christ are permitted to be nourished by the offering of his life present in the Eucharist. The Didache, or teaching of the Twelve Apostles, that's D-I-D-A-C-H-E, an ancient text, the Didache is a late first or second century anonymous teaching and liturgical text. I think I've seen outside dates on that for 60 to 140. Or it's in there somewhere, it was composed. The Didache says in the section on the Eucharist, but none shall eat or drink of your Eucharist, but those baptized in the name of the Lord. Finally, we get to our main point for our purposes. The real presence is strongly confirmed in no uncertain terms. There is no equivocation on Justin's part. The Eucharist is the flesh and blood of the incarnated Jesus. It is changed by the prayer of Jesus. So can we assume that Justin means the words of Jesus at the Last Supper? This is my body, this is my blood. I don't know. But it could be. Regardless, in this change, Christ's own flesh and blood nourishes our own flesh and blood. As Augustine would famously comment 250 or so years later, we become what we eat. But what I find most interesting in Justin's apology is the phrase, as we have been taught. One Catholic writer I consulted said the early church fathers interpreted the biblical passages about the Eucharist literally. And I suppose you could say that. 
But I think that that writer has it backwards. To me, a better way to say it is that the biblical, biblical passages confirm what the fathers were taught and were living. The word taught echoes what Cardinal Newman said. Justin was a faithful witness to the existing state of things. He was telling his experience of fact passed down to him, not his own opinion about what the biblical texts concerning the Eucharist meant. He was taught by another faithful witness about the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. He didn't make it up on his own. Nowhere does he refer to his belief in the real presence as being the result of his great knowledge of scripture or his own careful reading of the sacred text. No, he has been taught all that he is telling the emperor in this apology as a faithful witness should. This is a clear case to me of the Bible confirming sacred tradition and sacred tradition informing how we interpret sacred scripture. The Catechism states in Article 80, sacred tradition and sacred scripture then are bound closely together and communicate one with the other. For both of them flowing out from the same divine wellspring come together to form one thing and move toward the same goal. In this, I'm reminded of St. Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians. In chapter two, verse 15, he says, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that you were taught, either by an oral statement or by a letter of ours. Well, we do not know if Justin had access to Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians at this very early date. But it sure sounds like you received the oral teaching from a faithful witness. Now we move on to his dialogue with Trefo. This is the oldest extant Christian apology against Judaism. <laughs> and it brings up the third force that the church was in conflict with in its very early days the in internal force of Gnosticism, uh, people misreading Jesus completely, and then uh, the Roman authorities, he sent that last thing I read to the emperor, <laughs> and now Judaism, and there was a clash there. This dates from about the year 155. <clears throat> Trefo was most likely a Jewish rabbi and philosopher, although, as I said, he could have been a made-up opponent. In this apology, we get a more definitive idea of what Ignatius was referring to in his use of the word altar. The Eucharist is for Justin, the sacrificial meal of the new covenant. He writes, as I said before concerning the sacrifices which were offered, God speaks through Malachi, one of the 12, as follows. And now he quotes the book of Malachi. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord, and I will not accept your sacrifices from your hands. For from the rising of the sun until its setting, my name has been glorified among the Gentiles. And everywhere sacrifice is offered to my name, and a clean offering. For great is my name among the Gentiles, says the Lord, but you profane it. End quote. So that's the end of his quote from uh, Malachi. And Justin continues. It is of the sacrifices offered to him in every place by us, the Gentiles, that is, of the bread of the Eucharist, and likewise of the cup of the Eucharist, that he speaks at that time. And he says that we glorify God's name while you profane it. That meaning the Jews profane it. So we need to understand his apologetic for this. You know, he's arguing against the Jewish rabbi. And because of this, he must feel the need to use the Jewish scriptures against his opponent. He's quoting Malachi chapter 1, verses 10 through 12 for his argument. Malachi is one of the 12 minor prophets in the last book of the Old Testament. It was written probably by an anonymous author in about mid 5th century BC as the exiles were continuing to return from the exile in Babylon. The people had lost their fervor. They were lukewarm in their faith in Yahweh. There were abuses by priests. Marriages with pagans were not uncommon. The author chastises the people for their indifference which taints their sacrifices with impurity. And this could be a warning for us in our own reception of the Eucharist, you never know. So even though this is the original context of these verses, Justin applies them to the new covenant and not the old. My new American Bible notes say this about these verses. The imperfect sacrifices offered without sincerity by the people of Judah are displeasing to the Lord. He will rather be pleased with the offerings of the Gentile nations throughout the world, which anticipate the pure offering to be sacrificed in messianic times. 
So these Bible notes, you probably have the same ones, these Bible notes reflect the usage of Justin. In fact, there are frequent times in early church literature where these same verses from Malachi are used to describe the sacrifice of the new covenant, the pure sacrifice of the Gentile nations. <clears throat> Again, we need to keep in mind that many Old Testament prophecies have been used historically by Christians who see their ultimate and best fulfillment in Christ, even though they had a more immediate message and fulfillment for the Jews in the Old Covenant. I can think of several, but I'm, I'm already talking too much. <laughs> you could probably think of some. <clears throat> As I mentioned previously, the Didache is a first or early cent second century Christian catechetical text concerned with pra uh, faith, practice, and morals. In the Didache, we read this. <clears throat> On the Lord's Day, that is Sunday, gather together, break bread, and give thanks after confessing your transgressions, so that your sacrifice may be pure. For this is that which was proclaimed by the Lord. And now the Didache quotes uh, Malachi also, just verse 11. In every place and time, let there be offered to me a clean sacrifice. So again, we see that use of Malachi, and this is just verse 11. Of chapter 1 in conjunction with the sacrifice of the early Christians the phrase for this is that which was proclaimed by the Lord is a clear reference to the sacrifice offered on the Lord's day to the composer or composers of the Didache as well as Justin then Malachi is prophesying about this pure sacrifice which will occur in every place and time again the early Christians are using the Bible in this case and Old Testament prophecy to confirm what they already live as an accepted belief and practice. There is, in fact, a sacrifice that the Christians offer. And it is serious business. The Didache says that confession is needed to prepare for its reception and enjoy its fruits. Well, just think of what happens at Mass. You know, we our service begins with the penitential light as we prepare to receive the Lord in communion. We examine our conscience, we confess our sins. And then we say, have mercy, Lord. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. So not much seems to have changed. In about the year 96, although my go-to uh, patristic scholar William Jurgens places this at 80 because of internal evidence in the letter, St. Clement of Rome, who was most likely the third successor of Peter as Bishop of Rome, wrote a letter to the church in Corinth. Clement is thus a man of the apostolic age. The Corinth church was in turmoil. Wasn't it always in turmoil? No. <laughs> Bishops had been tossed out. Clement chastises this church for it. He says, Our sin will not be small if we eject from the episcopate those who blamelessly and holily have offered its sacrifices. Well, what sacrifices could bishops be offering? What sacrifices only theirs to offer? We know from Ignatius, not from what I read, but from other sections of Ignatius, <clears throat> that bishops are the presiders or the presidents at the Eucharistic liturgy spoken of by Justin. Justin calls him the president. <clears throat> and I'm of the opinion that these are the sacrifices, I'm losing my voice, <clears throat> of the new covenant, the one pure sacrifice spoken of by Malachi, which the Council of Trent identified as the universal sacrifice of the mass. <clears throat> in all three of these ancient texts, then, Justin, the Didache, and Clement, we see this concept of sacrifice being applied to the Eucharist. And it will recur in our next ancient source as well. Here's your man, Mark. Did you say that? He said that, oh, somebody mentioned Irenaeus to me. Oh, it's Pat. <clears throat> And our last source, our last big source, is Irenaeus of Lyon, whose feast day is June 28th. In the second century, St. Irenaeus was perhaps the last living connection with the apostles themselves. He was born in about 140 AD to a Christian family, somewhat odd for a Greek at this time. He grew up in Smyrna, in Asia Minor, under the tutelage of the ancient the aged bishop, St. Polycarp. There's our buddy Polycarp again. <clears throat> His feast, by the way, I'm into feasts. I mentioned everybody's feast. His feast is February 23rd. And I mentioned him previously as having been a friend of Ignatius. Polycarp himself was martyred in about the year 155. I believe he was burned at the stake. He was, like Ignatius, a disciple of John the Apostle. How do we know that? Irenaeus tells us. He says, 
I am able to describe the very place in which the blessed Polycarp sat and the accounts which he gave of his intercourse with John and with the others who had seen the Lord. So in this connection through Polycarp, Irenaeus has excellent credentials. Through his work against heresies, that's against heresies, that's the name of his work, primarily against Gnosticism, and we're still fighting Gnosticism in the mid second century. He is known as an early apologist and defender of orthodoxy. He was the key theologian in the development of Catholic teaching in the second century. And he also uh, is the first one to witness to the four gospels we have in our Bible, in his writings. In fact, uh, Pope Francis just named him the 37th doctor of the church in January, on January 21st of this year. In about 178 AD, Irenaeus became second bishop of Lyon in southern France. We don't know how he died. He could have been martyred. Uh, he sort of fades away in the history we don't hear from. Against Heresies is a series of five books written between 180 and 199. In these books, he argues that Orthodox Christianity was passed down from the apostles. Sacred tradition, there it is. It is taught by, by their successors, the bishops of the church, not by sects which have no connection to them. That would be the Gnostics and through whom salvation comes only via secret knowledge of the divine. When discussing public worship, i.e. liturgy, against the Gnostics, Irenaeus brings together belief in both real presence and sacrifice. In his fourth book, we read, He took from among creation that which is bread, and gave thanks, saying, This is my body. The cup, likewise, which is from among the creation to which we belong, he confessed to be his blood. He taught the new sacrifice of the new covenant, of which Malachi, one of the 12 prophets, had signified beforehand. Here's the same quote from Malachi. You do not do my will, says the Lord Almighty, and I will not accept, your sac your, the, accept sacrifice at your hands. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is glorified among the Gentiles. And in every place, incense is offered to my name and a pure sacrifice. For great is my name among the Gentiles says the Lord Almighty. And that's the end of his quote from Malachi. <clears throat> he continues, By these words, he makes it plain, he meaning the prophet, makes it plain that the former people will cease to make offerings to God, but that in every place sacrifice will be offered to him, and indeed a pure one. Sacrifice as such has not been reprobated, which means condemned or denounced in this context. There are sacrifices then, there are sacrifices now, sacrifices in the church. Only the kind has been changed. Now this quote seems pretty straightforward to me. Irenaeus uses the same verses from Malachi, which are used by Justin and the Didache, to confirm the new covenant sacrifice offered in the church. He does what the Catholic Church has continued to do, that is, call the scripture as a witness to what she lives and what she believes. The Gnostics, who Irenaeus opposes, hold that matter is evil. Therefore, they believe that the resurrection is a purely spiritual phenomenon. They believe in only a resurrection of soul, but not body. The body is not raised. For them, Jesus was not the begotten Son of God incarnate, but achieved his enlightened status by his own secret knowledge, or gnosis. Irenaeus argues for a resurrection of both soul and body. For Irenaeus, matter, the stuff of creation, the stuff of our senses, matter is good. He said that since Jesus was both earthly and heavenly, so the Eucharist consists of both earthly and heavenly elements as well. And so it nourishes our earthly flesh as well as our heavenly spirit. He writes, how can they, meaning the Gnostics, that's who he's opposing, how can they say that the flesh which has been nourished by the body of the Lord and by his blood, gives way to corruption and does not partake of life. The Eucharist confirms our opinion, for we offer to him those things which are his, declaring in a fit manner the gift and the acceptance of flesh and spirit. For as the bread from the earth, receiving the invocation of God, is no longer common bread, but the Eucharist, consisting of two elements, earthly and heavenly, so also our bodies, when they receive the Eucharist, are no longer corruptible, but have the hope of resurrection into eternity. If the body be not saved, 
then in fact, neither did the Lord redeem us with his blood. And neither is the cup of the Eucharist the partaking of his blood, nor is the bread which we break the partaking of his body. As with Ignatius and the Docetists, so also for Irenaeus and the brand of Gnosticism he is fighting. Belief in the real presence is a given. His argument is concerned with the resurrection of the body, which the Gnostics deny. No, says Irenaeus, and he uses the real presence to buttress his argument. He says the Eucharist consists of both heavenly and earthly elements. Thus, the real presence of Jesus' flesh and blood in the Eucharist is exhibit A in his argument. The Eucharist is both heavenly and earthly, just as the resurrection consists in both resurrection of the soul and of the body. Once again, as with the other fathers, we see Irenaeus writing as a witness. One faithful witness, John the Apostle, passed the faith to another faithful witness, Polycarp, who passed it down to Irenaeus. In this way, Irenaeus attests to the fact of the real presence in making his case for bodily resurrection. He does not argue as to the validity of the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. His argument about the resurrection presupposes that accepted lived belief. And you'll notice that these early fathers do not ever get into debate as to the nature of the Eucharist itself. It is used, though, as a primary witness to make points about Jesus' humanity. I have a friend who moved away years ago who used to say all those ancient heresies are all about Christology. Who is Jesus? And these guys are confused about his humanity, obviously. <clears throat> the Eucharist is always, as Ignatius says, the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And as J.N.D. Kelly says, unquestioningly realist. There is never an argument concerning this idea of symbolic versus real in terms of Jesus' presence. His presence is for the fathers as real in the Eucharist as his flesh was when he walked the earth. What's more, the Eucharist is the sacrificial meal of the new covenant, allowing communion with God. But how can this be? They don't answer that question. Mm -hmm. They feel no need to answer that question. They're not concerned with how it can be. They attest to the fact that it is. They're really witness, as Newman says, to the mystery of faith, this mystery of faith, which has been handed down, passed down to them. Anybody asleep yet? No. Okay. One last confirming text is the apostolic tradition. I like this right here. The apostolic tradition, which was written about 215 AD. So this is 2000, or what is this, 2022? 1800 years old. This is 1800 years old. And this was written by Hippolytus of Rome, who uh, was around about 170 to 235. Those were his dates. This gives us the most complete liturgy that has survived from ancient times. And I like to quote the Eucharistic prayer from this liturgy, which is almost 2,000 years old. The bishop says, the Lord be with you. And all the people say, Amen. And the bishop says, lift up your hearts. And all the people say, The bishop says, let us give thanks to the Lord. Boy, do I feel powerful. <laughs> You are absolutely correct. Every answer was correct. <laughs> and the bishop continues, We give you thanks, O Lord, through your beloved child, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent us in these last days as Savior, Redeemer, and Messenger of your counsel. He is your word, inseparable from you, through whom you created all things, and in whom you are well pleased. From heaven you sent him into the womb of the Virgin, and once conceived within her, he was made flesh, and was shown to be your Son, born of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin. Fulfilling your will and winning for you a holy people, he stretched out his hands as he suffered that by his death he might free those who believed in you. When he was betrayed to his willing death, so that he might abolish death, break the bonds of the devil, trample hell underfoot, give light to the righteous, set a term of sentence and manifest his resurrection, he took bread and giving thanks to you said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. In the same way the cup, saying, this is my blood, which is shed for you. When you do this, do so in memory of me. Well, that sounds like we're sitting at mass on Sunday morning. Not much has changed in 2000 years. I have one more quote from this document by Hippolytus, who was at one point in time an anti-pope. 
he's a saint because he was martyred, I believe. <laughs> uh, and his quote is, let everyone take care that no unbaptized person tastes the Eucharist, that none of it fall and be lost. For it is the body of Christ to be consumed by those who believe and not to be treated lightly. After the cup has been blessed in the name of God, you receive it as the blood of Christ. So spill nothing from it. Well, that's all pretty obvious stuff. And with that, I end that little survey. I could continue, though, to quote ancient texts and church fathers down through the ages. I see some nodding heads. <laughs> Suffice it to say that contrary to about 70% of Catholics, all of the fathers believed in the real presence. Nobody was a dissenter. This presence is echoed by 20th century Catholic writer Flannery O'Connor. When a friend described the Eucharist as a pretty good symbol, she irreverently responded saying, if it's only a symbol, then to hell with it. <laughs> Rather feisty woman. <laughs> Additionally, all of the fathers believe that the Eucharist is the sacrificial meal of the new covenant. These two facts are never questioned. To be Catholic for an ancient Christian was to accept this mystery of faith, even though you didn't mentally comprehend it. After all, who does? And who comprehends the incarnation? No hands are going up. Mine is down. Yeah. In John 660, at the conclusion of the Bread of Life discourse, many of Jesus' own disciples left him, acknowledging, this is a hard saying. Who can accept it? Hard indeed, but the church accepts it because she believes the one who said it. As Peter says in verse 68 of this same passage, Jesus has the words of eternal life. Aquinas repeated that belief 1,200 years later. He wrote, What God's Son has told me, take for truth I do. Truth, that's capital T on truth for Jesus. Truth himself speaks truly, or there's nothing true. In fact, the accepted unquestioned facts of belief and practice hold for all Catholic teaching. It's important to acknowledge that no belief is ever fully defined in detail until it's denied. Despite some controversial writings in previous centuries, around the um, 10th and 11th centuries, I believe, uh, the, the, and the controversy had to do with how is Jesus present. The theologians started to dig into that a little bit, but no one denied the pre real presence. The real presence was not defined dogmatically until the Council of Trent in the 16th century after it was completely denied by some groups of Protestants. Not Martin Luther for sure, he did not like those people. <laughs> this is no different than the full humanity and divinity of Christ being completely defined at the Council of Chalcedon in 451, about 150 years after the Arians of the 4th century first opposed that belief. Or the canon of the Bible being dogmatically defined at the Council of Trent after the accepted canon of scripture, which was in use for over a thousand years, was rejected at the time of the Reformation. The amazing thing is that no one denied the real presence completely until the Reformation. It took 1,500 years for it to happen. And a point which I keep coming back to <clears throat> is the importance of sacred tradition. And it's very obvious uh, thread throughout my entire talk. Doing my research and contemplating the quotes I've read has made me realize how important sacred tradition is. And it's not the same as the telephone game. <laughs> it's a lived belief, a breathing, trusting faith daily that's passed on. Our belief is passed from generation to generation. Scripture confirms it. Liturgy brings it to us on a consistent basis, like weekly or even for some daily. Father Jason Charon, a Ukrainian Catholic priest, please pray for Ukrainians, very bad, has said, tradition frees us from the slavery of novelty. I like this line. As Catholics, we don't have to figure out how to celebrate Mass or determine what our own opinion of the Eucharist is by carefully studying Scripture. Well, Scripture study is important, of course, but the point is that we live our belief. It's handed down to us. We freely attest to the fact of our living belief just like the fathers did. And we act on this belief when we celebrate the liturgy. We fast for an hour before we go to Mass. We genuflect before the Lord in the tabernacle. We kneel in pews. We praise in prayer. Just think of the Gloria and the Eucharistic prayers. We sing holy, 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 and acknowledge this Lamb of God who takes away our sin. With reverence, we receive the body of the Lord 
And then St. Cyril of Jerusalem, whose feast is tomorrow, by the way, <laughs> said almost 1,700 years ago, we make of our left hand a throne for the right, since we are about to receive into it a king. I love that. <laughs> we worship the host, exposed in adoration, and respectfully place it back in its holy receptacle. In short, we treat the Eucharist as if it is Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Gustav Mahler, the great Bohemian composer, is alleged to have said, I don't think he said it, was the first to say it, but he used this quote, tradition is not the worship of ashes, but the preservation of fire. I'm going to say that again, it's such a good quote. Tradition is not the worship of ashes, but the preservation of fire. I like this line too. I like Gustav Mahler. Anybody listen to his first symphony? <laughs> For Mahler, this referred to the art of musical composition which was built on over a thousand years of theoretical and practical musical evolution passed down through the centuries. And for us, this should refer to the passing on of the faith of the first Catholics. That is, not the ashes of piles of ancient teachings from which we can pick and choose, but rather the preservation of the fire of the ancient faith of our first ancestors who passed it to us and gave their lives for its sake. And that preservation of the faith passed on includes belief in the Eucharist, which is the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the medicine of immortality. And so to those 70% of Catholics who don't share this ancient belief, and maybe a few doubters in our pews, I say, come home. And don't forget that the fathers always know best. <laughs> <laughs> I stole that line from this book. I think. <laughs> so I do have a few. No one's asleep yet. Uh, anyway, this is a collection of ancient writings and ancient liturgies called the Mass of the Early Christians. This is the one I just stole my last line from. <laughs> the Fathers Know Best. Uh, what I like about this is it's got this compilation of all of these uh, these uh, heresies at the beginning. If you really want to know your heresies, they're all here. Uh, here's. <laughs> A translation I've been going through the Apostolic Fathers, a new translation, and uh, that's a, that's good to read too. And then if you're, especially if you're insomniac, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> this is my go-to guy, William Jurgens. This is a three-volume set, and, and it's not for insomniacs. He, he uh, these are select quotes, and it's all categorized and cataloged. So when you go to the back of the book, you can find out what they have to say on various and assorted topics. You know, and, and who said it? That's why that's so wonderful. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm done, but I'm supposed to say, right? We questions. This. Oh, oh, I'm supposed to say questions. Questions. <laughs> Anybody got a question? <laughs> no questions. And Well, I'm oh. just wondering, how do you think it is that so many, so what, 70% of Catholics, why don't they believe? We're not asking that question to the right person. <laughs> they haven't had the tradition passed on to them. We were just talking about that yesterday, our own kids. Yeah, I don't know. I have no answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Bad catechesis. I have no idea what the, you know. What's that? Or no catechesis. No catechesis. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, you know, we've had some issues the last whatever, how many years. You know, we've had, yeah. we've had priest issues. Uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe like they say, I mean, I don't know. People, the, the marriage, <coughs> not passing it down fully through a family. I don't know. It could be. Sort of schools. I mean, I'm yeah. just thinking of where they might receive they this know. teaching. Yeah, right. Well, I, don't know. I think part of it, I, I agree, and, I, and it's, a, it's a concept that for somebody that believes to answer it is like mind boggling, but I'm looking, I'm sitting here thinking about how I grew up and how I'm trying to teach my children. And my brother was raised the same way. He doesn't go to church. He doesn't believe this. Like, and I'm going, what is wrong? And I, exactly, I think it comes down to a passion where it, it's in me. You know, like I have that passion, I have that love. I have that connection with God, and I just know it's there. A gift of faith. Yeah, and like 
I'm totally okay taking things on faith. <laughs> my, my brother is more of the, you have to prove it to me. He's very much fits up to his middle name, Thomas, for doubting Thomas. I mean, you have to prove it to him. I understand I have a brother, Thomas, who's a Buddhist. <laughs> I understand. Yeah. Uh, and that's one thing that, you know, this does, this kind of skirts past that issue of uh, uh, taking it on faith because it was handed to me by someone else who believes it yeah. and then trying to find out on my own, discovering that on my own. But I think uh, we just need to have, an, we really, I'm going to sound like, like, a, like a, an evangelical, we need to have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. We really do. Yeah, you need to make those available to teenagers, to children, yeah. to like all, not just, oh, this is important, let's teach it now in kindergarten or whatever. It needs to be, like you said, the encounter. It needs to be most yearly, you know, all the way down the line and reinforce what their passion is for their connection to God. And in addition yeah. to the encounter that comes through the institution, through schools, mm -hmm. and through the church, people are going to encounter Christ and develop a relationship with Jesus through you. You may be the only pages of scripture that they ever read. So it's, again, our witness, mm -hmm. um, our apostolic witness to the faith as well. Um, how we live it in our daily life. Right. How honest we are at work. How careful we are with people's reputations uh, that kind of thing people notice it yeah, yeah that's true and you know like that the end of the bread of life discourse that I just <coughs> mentioned uh, what happened that's the only time Jesus had disciples who left him mm -hmm. and this is crazy what are you talking about you know we don't we don't understand this at all and they walked away and then Peter said, well, where am I going to go? You're the only one who knows who's got the words of eternal life. You know, I got the words. You're the man. You know? uh, and because he had that personal connection, which maybe those other people had not had. I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I think personally, this is the first time I've ever been inter introduced to this, this type of education. If you don't have as in-depth knowledge as you have, it can be quite confusing. This is so and so. This is so and so. And if they don't have that introduction to these fathers, it's really hard to separate, you know. And you have to get people into reading. And I think to introduce something to young people, this something like this, could be very confusing. Oh yeah, well, it have to be tailored to them. Yeah. I mean, I, I taught kindergarten through sixth grade music at the same time that I taught guitar at Idaho State. And so I discovered there's some difference between a, between a six-year-old and between a college kid who comes in and goes, how do I get an A, you know? Yeah. But I'd like to say I appreciate the way you presented it. For, for someone oh. like you as ADD, my mind just all oh. over the place anyway, um, I was able to keep coming back to the subject we were talking about and pull it back together. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. Did you have uh, something you were going to say, Mary? No. Well, as you were reading the words of Malachi and then you were reading the Eucharistic canon, there were similar words mm -hmm. in both. That mm -hmm. was kind of a fall. Oh, Click. Uh -huh. Yeah. There were a lot of those for the ancient Christians where they took Old Testament quotes, you know, applied them to Jesus. No. Just a, a comment from a, a cradle Catholic. Uh, my first communion was the most wonderful ceremony. Uh, they had a big dinner, I mean, a big breakfast, uh, the, the dress and, and all of that. Uh, and, and I did go to a Catholic school, and so the preparation was, you know, inundated. And uh, when I hear that 70% of Catholics don't believe, it's kind of like, huh? Right. No, I know. I can't get that. Huh? Why? I know. When, yeah. I, when I saw that article, I went, what? I don't understand. Yeah, but, you know, it's true. Like you said, in my own family, it's the same way. There are six of us, and three of them believe, and three of them don't. And, you know. Gosh, that's pretty pretty good average right there. Yeah. 50, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, so, going on with, you're saying, you know, Jesus' body and Jesus' blood. Um, a while back, I don't know if you're still doing it here, where there was the non-alcoholic or the mustum oh that? yeah it's mustum okay. is that what that's called yeah. yes so i <coughs> it, how 
does that play? I guess I'm just thinking about it because of Jesus' body and Jesus' blood. How does that play into the fact that that could still be Jesus' blood, even if it's day? It's not even fermented. If it's, if yeah, it's not fermented. Like, thank you. I, you're in my brain. I can't get it out. Well, so I, I pass. So, <laughs> um, I was <laughs> Mustum has always been accepted as licit, lawful, um, approved by the church. In, in regulations that you see in the 1200s in France, they talk about the ability to use mustum. Mustum still has to be made, it has to be 100% grapes, and it's just that the fermentation um, is not so advanced that it creates a great deal of alcohol. It's just like with um, hosts that have low gluten. You, the church will not accept a no gluten host because then you don't have bread. But it will accept a very low, low gluten for the sake of those who have celiac disease. Yes. And likewise, mustum, um, you know, it's essentially grape juice, but it has the correct matter okay. for the Eucharist. And when we in this parish have used mustum, we're not currently using it. But when we have used it, it's because it's a mercy for some who would not otherwise be able to receive the blood of Christ, uh, because perhaps they have a, uh, they have a, a you know they are yeah. alcoholics yeah. or, or well, so forth. Um, could have some of the you can yeah. mix. I believe uh, Father Joe McDonald used to use. Right, correct. We have some priests who 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 need to use mustum rather than. Um, wine, but let me just say, even when we're using mustum, it shouldn't be Welch's. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it should be an approved um, church. It should be an ecclesially approved uh, gotcha. mustum. Yeah. Thanks, God. Any more questions I can hand off to Scott? <laughs> <laughs> I did say at the beginning, I am not a scholar. I'm a trained musician. <laughs> you don't know, one what, what of the things, that, like with the surveys and things, sometimes it's important to know what people don't know. Mm -hmm. Right, because yeah. It, because the bottom line is, it's not so much what, what people don't know, it's what we do about it. Because most of us, I, I grew up in went to Catholic schools, went to a Catholic college for a period, worked in two Catholic colleges. And, and, you know, for those of us who came through those opportunities, we had at least given to us pretty accurate teaching. But now there's an awful lot of kids growing up who had never been in the Catholic school, had never had great access to CCD and things like that. And as much as I, I support Catholic schools, having been very much a part of them, at the same time, I really think at times, uh, we need to put that same kind of energy and resources in, into CCD programs and, and trying to make sure all of our kids have every opportunity. And, and because they're kids, I'm not a lot of that it should not be only content, but also social aspects, yes. because you need both of those. As you all know, working with those kids to get them and their families there to have them be part of, to work something they want to go to so the family support it. But if we just keep raising people to what way we do, and then how do you get to the adults? I would guess that virtually everybody here was not disagreeing with the opening point of your talk. Right. The problem is, that. is how do we reach out to those other 70% to give them the opportunity to have that thought reintroduced to them? Yeah, I understand. Hopefully you know, bringing them back to a point to where they see what we are at, what we all believe. Right. Uh, doing this kind of talk here, I'm preaching to the choir. You know, that's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you're helping the choir to be to better able to sing it back what to I those around them. Sing it right. <laughs> yeah. It's very important. Yeah. Well, you know, part of that in, in my own my own personal journey is the fact that uh, I had to know why the Catholic Church teaches what it teaches. Where this, you know, why? 
go back to ancient sources and go, oh, it's the same, you know, it hasn't changed. Uh, and it confirms what you believe and it strengthens what you believe, you know. So for many years now, decades, the Catholic Church has been talking about the need for a new evangelization. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what you're discussing. Mm -hmm. and, and all of the things that you're proposing are, are how a new evangelization can take place. And obviously we don't have all the answers, but one of those answers is that we who are in the church can more easily explain the faith to others. And that's why Theology on Tap uh, saints for the season, adult faith formation. Uh, th that's why it's so important. And so my hat's off to Bill. Bill is on that committee. Anne is on that committee. Jennifer is on that committee as well. Um, thank you guys for your great work in helping our community to know our faith better. We appreciate it. Thank you, Scott. And and that reminds me, I'm supposed to plug some upcoming talks. <laughs> so next Wednesday, that's March 23rd, at 7 o'clock, Ann Heisel is going to do her Saint for the Season, and that is... St. Francis. St. Francis of Assisi. And then uh, two weeks after that, on April 6th, Jennifer Weiss is going to discuss... Julian of Norwich. Ah, Julian of Norwich, okay. And then the uh, next Theology on Tap is after Easter on... Uh, the 21st of April, and that is going to be a little different and really sounds like a lot of fun. The History of St. Joseph's, and it is going to take place at St. Joseph's Church, not down here. And one of the presenters is back there, Dr. Yvonne Mills is back there, and, and uh, Paul Yoakum is the other presenter. And we were told you have lots of stuff that's amazing. So, yeah, yeah. And, and that, that one in April is a, uh, not just a Catholic event, but a no, Pocatello-wide right. event for people to come and learn about St. Joseph's Church, yeah, to learn the history the of, yeah. that, of that church in their community. So, so bring a friend. Bring a friend, it's gonna be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Also, can I just ask, um, we have the first of our listening and discussion uh, table sessions, if you will, on March 26th. This is part of Pope Francis's Synod. Um, you've received some questions in the mail, and this is your opportunity to come and talk about your responses a little bit more fully um, and to engage in conversation with those around you. Um, I think so far we've had four people sign up, only four. We have a cap at 100. So, <laughs> Uh, yes, you have to let the parish know that you're coming. Why? Because it's an issue of facilitators for your tables. How many facilitators will we need? How much food do we need to... Uh, to yeah, yeah, there, there will be food. So please just call the office or email us and let us know that you'd like to be part of this first Synod session. Yeah, uh, we, we can use you. Yeah. Please, yes. So... Uh, that ends our session, and I have one more thing I'm supposed to remind myself to do, and that is plug in that. Uh, 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 yes. <laughs> yes. yes, that's critical. Plug in the cow is what it says. Yes. <laughs> last last time we didn't plug it in, and the school lost uh, like five crates of milk. So oh. yeah, so we got to replug. It makes so much noise that we unplug it for yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so thanks everybody for coming. Don't forget the upcoming events.